All right. So, thank you very much. Welcome to two candidates. And um, Joan has already given you each a nice introduction, and I can certainly attest to the fact that you guys have been working hard and out canvassing in the district and making sure that everybody knows everything there is to need to know about you. So, thank you very much, and thank you for participating tonight as well. So, we welcome you and we thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, the first question is um, is going to. Oh, oh no, no, sorry, the introduction. The introduction. <laughs> Dive right into it. Sorry. Okay. Three minutes are so up. So as I said, yeah. <laughs> wait for it. We're all right. We're moving along with it. Patrick, you're up first. Well, uh, thank you, the Situate Democratic. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. 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 Thank the Situate Democratic Town Committee for uh, hosting this evening. And what an appropriate venue. Uh, our brand new library here in Situate, a success story of public and private partnership, an example of great vision and a lot of hard work. So if there are any of you that were involved in that, thank you for uh, your involvement. I see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. But for those of you who might not know me, my name is Patrick Kearney, and I'm a candidate for the open state representative seat here in Marshfield and Situate. I'm a lifelong resident of the South Shore. My family roots go back to 1928 when my great-grandfather built our original family home here in Situate. I'm running for state representative because I understand this community. The issues that we are facing are not just talking points for me, they are me. I am the candidate that best represents the fabric of both of these towns. As a graduate of the Massachusetts Maritime Academy, an officer in the Naval Reserve, and as a member of the Strategic Sea Lift Readiness Group, I'm the only candidate in the race with military leadership experience, and I look forward to bringing that skill set to Beacon Hill to advocate for the residents of Marshfield and Situate. I'm the only candidate in this race who is employed. I work in both Marshfield and Situate. I've started my own software company. I'm a member of IATSE Local 11 Stage Handlers Union. And I'm the vice president of business development at the software company Price Blocks. This private sector experience is crucial to advocate on behalf of this district as the majority of its constituents earn their livelihoods in the private sector. I'm the only candidate in this race who's been employed as a captain, working both in charter and commercial fishing industries, um, you know, in an industry that is a vital part of our local economic engine. And this industry is under attack, and it's being overburdened by irresponsible government regulation written by people who have never even been fishing. My combined experience in government, the private sector, and organized labor along with my military leadership abilities, distinguish me to best effectively hit the ground running for our concerns. I also believe that if you're going to represent the people, that you need to know the people, which is why since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on 4,700 doors, and I will continue that effort up until Election Day. I'm really looking forward uh, to tonight's discussions, and I look forward to hopefully representing all of you on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Situate Democratic Town Committee for having us here, and thank you to you as well, Pat. This is our second forum in two nights, so Pat and I are spending a lot of time together this week because we have another one on Friday, yeah. uh, which is uh, a lot of fun. We're having fun. Um, my name is Sean Costello. I am a lifelong resident of this district, and I'm proud to sit before you here as a candidate for state representative. Uh, I'm running for state representative because now more than ever, the people of Marshfield and Situate deserve a passionate advocate, somebody with experience, somebody who knows how things work in government, and somebody who knows this district. Uh, I was raised in Marshfield, where I still live today, um, by two parents who uh, define a, a, a hard-working family. Uh, my dad uh, pulled long hours at Verizon as I grew up. was a Longtime union member of IBEW 2222. Uh, my mom was a longtime member of the Marshfield Education Association Union, uh, where she worked at the public schools and pulled two part time jobs on the weekends just to make ends meet. Uh, seeing their commitment to raising a family into their community made me want to get involved as well. So when I was uh, in high school, I was just 16 years old, there was an open seat for state rep. And I got involved with the campaign for Jim Cantwell, who has served us so incredibly well for the past 10 years. 
Uh, I later ended up helping Jim run his campaigns. And uh, through that, I saw the devotion that he has for this district and the commitment that he has to the people of Marshfield and Situ. Um, I also uh, took my involvement to another level when I started uh, working on the leadership team to build a new Marshfield High School, which was a successful effort. Uh, and I was briefly uh, the chairman of the Marshfield Democratic Town Committee uh, until this position opened up and I decided to give all of my effort to that. Uh, for the last four years, I've worked at the State House as legislative director to a state representative from Quinn, <coughs> Democrat Bruce Ayers. Uh, and I've also uh, been a member of the Marshfield School Committee going on four years now, where I'm in my second term and have served as chair uh, since 2016. I'm uh, very proud of all of the things we've accomplished there, and, and especially proud to say that under my leadership, uh, we just implemented a full day kindergarten, universal tuition free. Uh, for the entire town of Marshfield, uh, and we did it without cutting programs, without cutting positions, and without raising taxes. Uh, that's the kind of sensible, forward-thinking leadership that we need on Beacon Hill, and that is why I want to serve you. I want to bring my experiences and serve the community that has served me so well as I grew up and went through public school in Marshfield. I want to represent you and your interests. I want to be that passionate advocate, and I want to be the person to utilize my experience to benefit each and every one of you on Beacon Hill. I look forward to a robust conversation tonight. We had a great one last night, and I'm sure we'll continue tonight. I appreciate you all being here to hear from the candidates. And either way, looking forward to electing a Democrat in November. Thanks for your time. And then, um, and we'll go back to Patrick for the first question. Um, what can be done to increase voter interests and voter participation in local and state elections? Well, I think that uh, what we're seeing on a national scale is certainly uh, increased voter awareness uh, and, and increased uh, individuals to want to get involved. I think that with Sean and I uh, both being kind of uh, young, passionate leaders and wanting to be involved, um, and encouraging our friends to be involved in our races, to be informed about the issues, to bring uh, bringing our family members uh, to discussions like this, to, to be made aware of uh, everything that the state representatives can do um, is something that encourages not only uh, our age group uh, to be involved in politics, but also for them to be exposed to that encourages their friends to be involved as well. Well, I, I agree, and Patrice, I'll say that, that for a specific policy, um, automatic voter registration is something that we should absolutely enact here in Massachusetts, and it seems as if it's moving in that direction, which is a good thing. Um, but let me ask you, and, and I agree completely, that on the national scene, it does seem to be driving out more people from the woodwork because it does get scarier and scarier by the day. Um, but let me ask a question of just a show of hand. How many people here are under the age of 30? <laughs> that right there, that's how you get people involved. Yeah. And, and, you know, I said on the radio last night, Patrick and I combined are not as old as Jim Cantwell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he heard that or not, but I hope he did. Um, but, and, and you know, uh, one thing that I've been really passionate about for the last uh, seven going on eight years is my involvement with the youth and government program. Uh, this year I had about 50 kids at Marshfield High School. It's a nonpartisan program where we teach them uh, the importance of civics. Uh, we get them together uh, once every two weeks to uh, respectfully exchange ideas. Uh, and we, we never impart our own political beliefs on them, uh, but we give them uh, a voice. And uh, I see for somebody like uh, Deb Cornwall, who's here, who came and spoke with my group this year and, and really uh, and, and encourage them to get motivated and get involved. So it's little things like that, and, and I'm inspired every day by the kids that I work with. Um, and, and, and you know, that's, that's the kind of way to get people involved. It is, uh, you're seeing it right now. This room's full. Good. Uh, either of you want to follow up anything? The other side? I think we're good. You're good. All right. Then the next question is for you, Sean, and it's flood insurance is a major issue facing our district. Yes. How are you prepared to continue Rep. Cantwell's leadership on this issue? Representative Cantwell's leadership, that's an understatement because Representative Cantwell has not only been a leader on this issue in Marshfield and Situate, he's not only been a leader on this issue in Massachusetts. 
Representative Cantwell has repeatedly taken the fight to Washington, <laughs> D.C. Uh, on our behalf. There are thousands of homes in Marshfield and situated uh, within a floodplain. And, and to be quite honest with you, uh, the maps just don't make sense in so many of the areas. The science behind them just didn't make sense. Uh, we need to uh, have somebody on Beacon Hill who's going to continue Rep. Cantwell's fight, who's going to keep pushing for the needs of our residents, um, but also somebody who's going to come with new, innovative ideas. Um, I referenced Joe Rossi, uh, who's been very active on this issue for a long time. I've known Joe for a number of years. He's a friend, and um, we've had a few discussions on this matter. He's the chair of the Massachusetts Coastal Coalition, and he's got a great idea uh, to create a fund in Massachusetts that would uh, create low interest loans or even grants for homes in areas of repeated loss uh, that would allow them to be lifted up. Uh, just a way to, to look to address that. And the available funds could be there uh, if a legislator is willing to push it. They just approved a feasibility study at the state level for that. They're looking forward to seeing the results of that. Um, but the National Flood Insurance Program expires on July 31st. There's still been no movement. Um, so. It will be uh, certainly interesting to see what continues to happen there. And if it does inspire, uh, so many people in Marshfield and Situate will be out thousands of dollars because they'll have to go to the private sector for their flood insurance. Um, and that, that is not fair to the residents of Marshfield and Situate. So I pledge to continue pushing that the way Jim Cantwell did. And I pledge to explore any and all new avenues uh, to address that. Um, so, yes, uh, former Representative Jim Cantwell uh, worked very, very hard on behalf of this district, and uh, a lot of the people that had worked with him uh, on his team are here tonight. I'm proud to have been endorsed by his former campaign manager, Steve Darcy, and I look forward to uh, continue, continuing work with Jim, with Steve, with Joe Rossi from the Coastal Coalition, and, and making sure um, that everyone in the floodplain has accurate flood insurance maps and that they are uh, protected. We had the last issuance of the maps. It was based on California tidal data. Uh, it wasn't accurate, and that was raising flood, insur flood insurance costs for individuals that were living in this district. And we shouldn't be uh, accepting a, a rise in costs for our residents, and it shouldn't be uh, unaffordable to live in the communities that we grew up in. So I look forward to not only working on the state level, um, a lot of those actually federal grants are already available to lift homes, um, you know, working with constituents to make sure that they feel uh, they have access to those grants and that um, we have accurate flood insurance maps, but also that we have a strong advocate at the state house that's fighting for funding for seawalls and other innovative ideas to protect our coastal homes. Okay, either of you want to add to that? Uh, I'd just like to, to, to quickly say that, um, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later on too, but I'm sure we both recognize the impact of climate change uh, on, on the rising sea levels, and I, I just wanted to say that I hope there's some questions on that coming up as well. Right now. Hey, how about that? <laughs> so, we're just going to extend that a little bit. So, what could you, what, what would you do for coastal problems um, that have resulted from climate change both in both of the communities? Is it okay. So uh, climate change is something that is affecting all of us right now. It's affecting, it's going to affect uh, specifically those members uh, that are under 30 that are joining us tonight, uh, even more so than uh, some of the older folks in the room. And it's something that we have to be prepared for. We know that sea levels are rising and uh, there's a multifaceted approach. We need to look at innovative ways that are being used in other parts of the world. The Netherlands, uh, a tremendous amount of their residents live actually below sea level. Um, we need an advocate to protect uh, our funds for seawalls and wave attenuation devices, other infrastructure uh, programs, but also to be forward thinking. As legislators, we should be incentivizing uh, renewable energy companies to be exploring uh, alternative methods of uh, energy to pr you know reduce our carbon footprint and, and making sure that uh, you know I was very disheartened to see what happened on the federal level pulling uh, pulling back from some of our uh, progress that we've made on a national scale of climate change and I think as Massachusetts legislators we should make sure that we uphold uh, the progress we've made in 
climate change. Oh yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the, uh, there is irrefutable science, science that tells us that our sea levels are rising. And that is because of climate change. And those rising sea levels can directly be attributed to so many of the issues that we are facing here in Marshfield and Situ. We know we have those rising sea levels. We know that we're facing more frequent and more severe storms every year. It seems that a 100-year storm comes around every three years. And it's only going to get worse unless Massachusetts does its part. Massachusetts, for our entire history, has not sat idly by when these big issues come up. Massachusetts has always taken a lead. Uh, there is legislation at the State House now that proposes raising the renewable energy portfolio, uh, and that is something that should absolutely be done. There's uh, so many more incentives that should be enacted, more incentives to, to uh, invest in solar energy. The public buildings uh, should be moving over towards uh, even more aggressive forms of renewable energy, and that's something that the state can start working on and providing more funding for. So there's so much to be said for climate change. Uh, it's absolutely a problem that everybody in this room has to face, and it's also a problem that we can all do something about uh, every day. It's going to take a, co a collaborative effort from every single person uh, in every single community across the state and across the country. Uh, and that's what we know. And we have to continue to work off of the science that we know. And as a state legislator, uh, I'll be unabashed in my uh, fight against climate change and in my fight for sensible environmental policies. Okay. Sean, uh, I'm sorry, Patrick, is there anything you want to add to that? Sean, anything additional to clarify? All right. Um, so, Sean, next question is for you. How would you work to solve sort of slash manage the opioid epidemic? Well, so the opioid epidemic is stealing a generation. Uh, I talked earlier about the kids that I work with uh, in Marshfield Public Schools, uh, and it, it breaks my heart to know that this is an issue that continues to get worse and that their generation is going to still be impacted by that. We recently lost uh, the first member of my graduating class from Marshfield High School to the opioid crisis about a year ago. It's devastating. It really is. And uh, we need to realize uh, that this is a public health crisis. We have uh, done a good job, and I will give the administration and the legislature credit for the investments they've made in treatment. Uh, but we have to invest even more in prevention. Uh, we need to look at how we teach people in the community the dangers of drug use, but specifically, we need to do that through public schools. Uh, and that's because our public schools educate 96% of students in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I believe, through my experience on the school committee, which has solidified that belief, that public school is the silver bullet. It can solve almost any issue. But right now, in a town like Marshfield or Situate, if you want to implement a, a, a health curriculum that's comprehensive, there's only very limited funding available, and most of it uh, has to come from the local level. The state should be requiring a certain level of curriculum for elementary students to learn about the dangers of drug use in a sensitive way, and the state should be backing that up with funding because we are losing a generation. Uh, that's something that I've been fighting for in the Marshfield School Committee, and that's uh, the, uh, something I'll bring to the State House, my knowledge on the inner workings of that. Situate, by the way, is a model for their uh, comprehensive health curriculum uh, in addressing drug use. That's thanks in large part to my friend Anne Marie Galvin uh, and so many others who have worked so hard. But there's still so much more to do. So I think that this opioid crisis is probably the number one issue that's facing all generations. Here in Marshfield and Situate, uh, for this representative district, last year alone we had 40 overdose deaths, 63,000 in the United States, and as the only candidate in the race with military leadership experience, uh, that's what we need to solve this problem. And we need someone that is going to go after pharmaceutical companies that are pushing these drugs, someone uh, that understands that we in the United States are the only country in the world that allows pharmaceutical companies to market directly to the consumer. We push drugs to individuals, and, and that's even to kids watching TV at a young age. We need
to make sure, we need a leader to make sure that that's not happening. We need to implement a uh, policy that holds manufacturers accountable and uh, kudos to the Attorney General uh, and all the good work that she's done. Um, we need appropriate and necessary funds uh, for treatment programs. It's important, the governor's doing a great job uh, with the Attorney General on the state level, but I think it's important for the next state rep to be addressing these problems at the local level. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, going to the ribbon cutting ceremony at the Situate Peer Recovery. All the great work that they do there, uh, Mike Bowman, uh, Anne Marie Galvin. Um, we need to make sure that there's adequate funding from the state for those treatment centers so that uh, the people that are already struggling with addiction have access uh, to affordable and adequate uh, treatment facilities. If I could just add on, too, and yeah. just to kind of pile on, um, you know, it, it's absolutely true that we need to address. Uh, the influence of pharmaceutical companies and, and the availability of these drugs uh, and that's the, the first comprehensive opiate bill in the United States was passed here in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. I was privileged to be at the bill signing for that when Governor Baker signed it into law and that bill uh, created a prescription monitoring program. It also uh, limited the first prescription of an opiate to a seven day supply for an adult and it limited all prescriptions for people 18 or younger to seven days. Um, that's a good start, uh, but it's a start, and there's still so much more work to do. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Sean. I think that uh, I think it's also multifaceted, and I think that uh, we need to integrate a wide range of informed voices and experts uh, speaking with not only people that are, um, you know, in the pharmaceutical business, but uh, talking with chiefs of police, uh, talking with doctors and uh, addiction experts, uh, mental health counselors as well, and bringing all of those informed voices into the same room. And that's the leadership we need. We need all of those people talking together. And I also think we need, uh, you know, the criminal justice system needs to be reformed. Uh, it costs us a lot of money uh, to be putting people that are suffering with addiction away, and it would actually not only save us taxpayer dollars, but it would also, uh, you know, it's, it's the more compassionate thing to do, is, is to help those in need. And, uh, and that's what we need to be doing in the legislature. Okay, good, thanks. Um, right, so the next question is to start with you, Patrick. Um, what do you think about what is currently going on on the U.S. Southwest border regarding aspirant immigrants? And how would it affect your work as a state rep? And sort of another part of the same thing, question is, what is your position on sanctuary cities? So I don't think that anyone in this country uh, or anybody in this room likes what's happening at the border. Uh, I don't think that anyone is pro-separation of families. Uh, but there is a reason that immigrants come to this country. Everyone here is a product of immigration unless they're a Native American. And uh, just m much like our forefathers, the people that are uh, struggling at the border are coming to America in search of the American dream. And I think that it's important that we have a unambiguous way to become an American citizen. The, Im the immigration system right now on the federal level is broken. We need to be working with our federal reps. We have a, a, a lot of very strong advocates um, on Federal Hill, and we need to be uh, talking with them about what we think of it and, and any ideas that we might have to revamp the immigration system, we need to be working with them on that. Um, but I don't think that federal uh, officials should be working against state officials. And I think that um, you know we, we should be encouraging immigrants uh, to come here in a legal manner. Well, you know, uh, I, uh, I agree the, the immigration system at the federal level is broken and it's not serving those people who want to come here to the land of opportunity. And, uh, you know, we need to uh, make sure that we are uh, pounding that drum as somebody at the state level uh, to make sure that our federal officials uh, know uh, that this is how our constituents feel. Um, you know, it is reprehensible that children are being separated from their families at the border. It is reprehensible. Uh, and the lies that continue to come from the administration when they're confronted on it is also reprehensible. Um, and they should be ashamed. Uh, but the state representative has to realize 
that uh, we do things in a certain way for a reason. And, and I agree that the state uh, should not be directing their law enforcement officials to uh, directly conflict with the federal laws, uh, if only because, and I've spoken with uh, a number of public safety officials here in Marshfield and here in Situate about that, um, you know, there's certain programs uh, that would not, that the way the bill is written, the Safe Communities Act, uh, that would not uh, be able to be put into effect anymore. Um, you know, the perfect example is that, uh, you know, Situate police would not be able to share information on, uh, you know, known drug dealers with Plymouth County law enforcement the way the bill is written. Um, so we have to make sure that we're uh, banging that drum uh, to our federal officials um, and we also need to make sure that we're keeping our eyes on the prize uh, you know, here at the local level. Uh, something that I'm really proud of that we did in Marshfield in our public schools is that when I started on the school committee, our English language learners program had only 13 or 14 participants. Uh, we saw uh, that we thought the number was going to grow and with our limited funding available, we decided under my leadership as chair to provide more staffing. Just two years later, that number has grown to over 40 students. So those are the things that we can be doing for our uh, immigrant community, uh, and we need to continue to fight that fight at the local and state level when we can. I'm just curious. Um, you said Plymouth County officials working against uh, town officials. What, what's your position on federal officials working against state officials? Because that's no, the sanctuary that. city. No, I just said thing that. Is. I, I think that federal officials and state officials should not be pitted against each other. Okay. So you're not in support of the state no, community? Absolutely not, especially the way it's written. Either of you want to add anything else, Patrick? Sean? Nope. Okay. All right. Um, got a couple of questions about sort of what we Democrats need to do or are going to do over the next few months. So the first one is, as a Democrat, what are you going to do to make certain that Charlie Baker does not win in November? So for this one, we're starting with Sean. Sure. Uh, so I'll tell you now that I've, I've met Charlie Baker a number of times. Uh, when I worked in the State House, his office was uh, literally in the same staircase as ours. Um, he is a nice guy, um, but I'll tell you that for the last uh, you know, six ish months before this election, uh, I was the chairman of the Marshfield Democratic Town Committee, and we started to implement plans um, to create more of an awareness uh, among Democrats in Marshfield. I was just last week uh, to mention Deb again. You and I were doing a postcard party, writing to what we call lazy Democrats who vote in presidential elections but don't come out to vote in gubernatorial uh, elections. Um, so, you know, uh, I think Charlie Baker is a nice guy. Uh, he lost my vote uh, for good when he went on TV in 2016 on a commercial for the Yes on Two campaign. Uh, that is, as far as I've seen, probably the only strong stance on an issue, on a divisive issue that he's taken, uh, and it was for an issue that took much needed funds away from our public schools uh, without a way to reimburse them. Um, I fought on the statewide level against the passage of question two, was proud to do some local media availability stuff here, and then the campaign called me and said, gee, you sounded pretty good on the radio, how'd you like to do some more for us? I said, sure. Uh, thinking that they want me to do another thing on ATD. Before I knew it, I was sitting uh, in Jim Brody's studio at WGBH, uh, debating one-on-one -on -one with the woman who was leading the charge for the implementation of uh, lifting the Catholic charter schools. Um, and of course, we're very proud that that question did not pass. Uh, you know, we were one of the first school committees in the entire state to issue a resolution against that. Um, and we sent a loud and clear message to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So it's a, a long-winded answer about Charlie Baker, but I'll tell you now, he lost my vote because of that, and I will never be ashamed to say that, and I'll continue to spread that message, that that's the only thing I've seen him take a strong stance on, and it was the wrong stance. Okay, Patrick? So I think that uh, both of us aren't going to do anything uh, to prevent Charlie Baker from getting elected. Uh, one of us is going to go on to the general election and uh, being in the second most conservative district in the state of Massachusetts, we should be helping each other out to make sure that we keep this state representative seat blue. Uh, so I don't think that either one of us are going to be making sure that Charlie Baker is going to get elected or not. Um, they're also, I disagree with him on 
a plethora of different issues. Uh, but Charlie Baker has taken the time to come to this community. Uh, he's secured $280 million worth of funding uh, for seawalls. He's come and spoken with the fishermen and been an advocate uh, for that industry that I'm a vital part of. And, you know, something that drives our local economic engine. It's not just the fishermen. It's, uh, you know, the fuel businesses. Kenny Duvall's uh, fuel business. Sean Harris's fuel business. We're not buying bait from Pete Belson or uh, Scotty Sinclair down in Green Harbor. Um, and when we can't fish, you know, uh, its effects are, are uh, broad across the spectrum. So, uh, as many other Democrats have said, uh, including the Attorney General, the Mayor of Boston, um, and Senator Markey as well, uh, Jim Cantwell's boss now, um, they have said, you know, we don't agree with him on everything, but he's doing uh, somewhat of a good job. And for this district, he's doing somewhat of a good job. I disagree with him on a lot of issues. Uh, but I think that you and I need to be focused on our own state representative seat, uh, you know, and working for each other uh, after September 5th, no matter what the results are, um, so that we, we keep this seat blue. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the, the uh, governor has worked with the legislature uh, to provide some significant funding. Um, but we also have to keep in mind sometimes that funding gets cut through 9C cuts and then has to be appropriated in other ways. Um, I don't disagree with him on everything, um, but the important issues to me, especially the funding of public education, couldn't be more far apart. Uh, he is a nice guy. He's done, uh, you know, he's, he's done his due diligence and he's been down to Marshfield and Situate multiple times. Um, but I also give a lot of credit to, to Jim Cantwell and to the legislature when it comes to appropriating those funds. Don't forget our colleagues in the Senate. Of course. <laughs> All right. And Joe um, Moschino. <laughs> All right, Patrick, you're starting with the next question. As Democrats, we know organized labor is essential to making sure workers are treated fairly. What is your stance about labor unions and collective bargaining? Uh, so this is something right now that's uh, under attack in the United States. I'm the only candidate uh, in this race that is a member of a labor union. And uh, I am proud to have received the endorsements from over a dozen labor unions. I have the support of the local 103 electricians, the iron workers, Mascot, Nage, um, the sheet metal workers, the Brockton Plymouth Building Trades, the South Shore Lobstermen's Association, uh, the New England Laborers Council, the Carpenters. Uh, so the labor support has been incredible and as someone uh, I have pledged to them, as I will pledge to uh, everyone that's in a labor union in this district and throughout the Commonwealth. I will be standing with labor uh, strong in the legislature and uh, continue to fight for their right to collectively bargain and earn a livable wage to uh, pay their mortgage and hopefully afford their own children a, a better opportunity that they may have had uh, growing up themselves. Well, you know, I will be a strong partner for labor on Beacon Hill, uh, and I have a proven record of being a strong partner for labor, not just on Beacon Hill, um, but at the local level as well. Uh, the gentleman that I worked for four years, Representative Ayers, uh, out of the entire legislature, is actually the second highest rated uh, labor supporter in the entire body. Um, you know, I, I've worked so closely with many uh, labor officials and, and members of labor unions. Uh, as I said earlier, both of my parents were in a union when I was growing up. Uh, thank God for that. Um, and I'm proud to have been endorsed by the Plymouth Bristol Central Labor Council, as well as the Norfolk County Central Labor Council, which are the umbrella organizations representing uh, well over 100,000 working men and women in both Plymouth County, Bristol County, and Norfolk County. Countywide, they're the umbrella organizations for the entire AFL CFL. Um, proud to have their support, proud to have the support of uh, IBEW 2222. Um, so I'll be fighting that fight, but at the local level, um, as a member of the school committee and as the chairman of the school committee, I just recently wrapped up negotiations with the Marshfield Teachers Union. Um, I led the negotiating team along with our superintendent, situate resident Jeff Granatino, uh, and it's the highest raise that we've given teachers in over 20 years, and it, that's because we understand the importance of keeping good staff and making sure that they are earning a livable wage with fair benefits. Uh, I've worked so closely with so many of these people over the years. We've implemented a lot of good things, and I'm proud 
that we've supported them in that way. It's also the only contract, uh, the second contract in the last 30 something years to be finished ahead of schedule. That's our commitment to labor. I've lived that, I have that proven record, and I'll take that proven record to Beacon Hill for our working families in Marshfield and situation. Yeah, Sean, I, I just have to cut you off real quick. The, I was done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, well, I'm glad I let you finish, but uh, <laughs> the fact is those uh, central labor councils are not AFL-CIO umbrellas. The AFL-CIO is an umbrella for them, and they right. are a part yes, of the AFL-CIO, yes. and the AFL-CIO went with a no endorsement. So, um, you know, I have to correct you on that because yep. that's that's not accurate. Yep, that they did. Um, that those are the so, regional uh, representation. And, yeah, and those people, but they're not the AFL CIO umbrella. Right. They, well, it, yes, the AFL CIO umbrella is is it's the AFL CIO and then the central labor sure, council. Sure. So, uh, and you know, I, and I think it's important um, to recognize that uh, it's not only surrounding yourself with those have, that may have supported labor, um, but worked with those uh, in labor. And I myself. Um, move stages with the State Chandler's Union. Uh, we're there late nights and, and early mornings uh, at Fenway, at, at Great Woods, at, at Gillette Stadium. Um, you know, moving stages, putting stages together, uh, breaking them down, and I understand firsthand that the concerns and the needs of, of labor, and I will stand with them just as I did uh, with the National Grid Workers at the rally. Uh, happy to stand with Boston City Councilors and the Mayor of Boston to, uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, Health care is reinstated and that they have livable wages. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I uh, also went and I protested with the uh, gas workers and uh, locked up from national grid. Um, you know, that's a, that's a terrible thing that's happening to them. Um, they do need their health care back. We, we've both spoken with people who have those stories. Um, and, you know, uh, thank God, I'll just end by saying thank God my parents were in uh, labor unions when I was growing up. Uh, you know, those, those, they fought for livable wages for both of them. Uh, they made sure that we had health benefits. They made sure that we were taken care of. And so thank God for uh, my parents being members of those unions uh, when we were, especially when we were going through some tough times. So I absolutely know firsthand what it's like to need the support of labor. Uh, and because of that, I'll be a strong support for labor at the state house. Okay, you guys have touched on something. Next question, um, which goes to Sean to start. What's your position on single payer health care? Uh, at the moment, I can't give you a solid position. I'm leaning no at the moment. Um, but that's purely and simply because uh, I need to do a little more digging into it. I think that the biggest health care concern uh, right now is what's happening on the federal level. Um, what the president has just done in rolling back Obamacare has um, taken access to health insurance coverage uh, away from seniors and, and young kids that may have a pre-existing condition. So I, 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 um, I understand that there's a huge push for single payer health care, but I think that we need to be addressing some of the health concerns that we have on a local level um, and on a federal level, uh, making sure that our constituents here in Massachusetts um, if they have a pre-existing condition, have access to affordable health care coverage, to making sure that our kids aren't drinking brown water here in Situate. Uh, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, that's definitely a concern. It's something that needs to be looked at. But I think the uh, important thing uh, for a state rep to do is prioritize where our resources uh, need to go. And uh, we might have a significantly larger health crisis on our hands if we don't have access to clean drinking water. Okay. And, uh you know, Massachusetts has been a leader on the issue of health care. We all know uh, the universal health care legislation that was passed and became the model for the entire uh, nationwide Affordable Care Act. We should be proud of that, uh, and we should be fighting to preserve that because uh, you're right. We're going to need it. Exactly. You know, on a national level, uh, President Trump is fighting every day to dismantle every accomplishment of the president that came before him, and that's not right. And that's where I would actually also disagree with Charlie Baker. Uh, he's, he's gutted the public health care system uh, in Massachusetts. And as you know, what keeps health care costs low, or uh, costs low in any um, you know, part of the economy, is competition. So if you're gutting competition, uh, you know, you're, you're increasing health care costs. So, uh, I, would, I would encourage that we you know, keep 
um, competition in healthcare until uh, we, we may move to that single payer system. I agree with you there, and I think we shouldn't be surprised at all to see that kind of action from a man who, when he was a healthcare executive, uh, cut positions and cut salaries and tripled his own salary. Uh, so and he outsour outsourced it to an uh, Indiana based exactly. company. Exactly. No. exactly. So, one of the many areas where uh, it's good that we disagree with Charlie Baker. All right. Next question for Patrick. Where do you stand on the November ballot question regarding the rights of transgender citizens? It's absurd to me that that's even on the ballot. Um, you know, as someone that has taken an oath to uh, serve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, um, I look forward to doing that uh, in the legislature. Um, we need strong leaders to advocate uh, to make sure that every individual uh, and their civil rights, whether, uh, you know, from, from any background, whether it's uh, gender, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, any race, religion, everyone's civil liberties in the United States needs to be protected. Uh, I'm happy to be joined here tonight by some of my uh, campaign volunteers. We went down um, to Duxbury with Jim Hamilton uh, from Marshfield. I'm not sure if you've worked with Jim, um, but we went down to Duxbury and we did uh, phone banking to make voters aware of uh, the November ballot question and, um, you know, support all LGBT, all members of the LGBTQ community to make sure uh, that that isn't passed. And, and we, we can see from all measurable statistics, this, uh, you know, civil rights um, measure has been implemented in 17 states throughout the country, and there is no uh, change in sexual assaults um, or sexual violence um, in, in the workplace or, or in any other public building or bathroom or anything like that. So I will be a strong advocate and, and stand with uh, all walks of life, not only um, in the legislature, but in any other facet uh, to make sure that their civil liberties and their civil rights are defended. Well, I'll absolutely be voting yes on question three to preserve uh, those protections for transgender individuals. I can say uh, one of my closest friends is a transgender individual, a very proud transgender individual, and I've worked with a couple of uh, transgender students uh, over the years through our Marshfield Public Schools uh, to support them. And um, it's great to see that their families are so supportive, um, and that's a good thing, but they need to see that their state is supportive, and, and it does disgust me that it's even a question on the ballot. Uh, and if you meet somebody in today's day and age uh, who says they're a Democrat, and they tell you that they're voting against question three, they're not really a Democrat. Uh, I'm proud to have They're not American. <laughs> it's unconstitutional. <laughs> it is. There, there's these protections. So, yeah. it, it's a shame that these protections have to even be uh, discussed at this kind of level. It should just be plain common sense. And I'm proud, uh, one of the proudest days that I had uh, working at the State House uh, was watching uh, my, my former boss, Representative Ayers, uh, join his voice with 132 other legislators from across the state and vote in favor of the transgender accommodations bill. That was a good day. Uh, unfortunately, there is more work to do because there is that public uh, perception out there that these people are anything less than equal. And it's absolutely not true. Um, you know, having worked with a number of students uh, who need that support, um, I would never be able to look them in the face if I was anything less than full-throated uh, supporter of question three. So I'll absolutely be voting for that and I'll be pushing all my family and friends uh, to do the same. It's important. Anything else to add? I think, I think we can agree on that one. I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the next question is for Sean to start. What can we do to make our schools safe given recent horrific events? Well, this is, uh, this is also a, a deeply personal uh, question for me, and, and that's because of the students that I've had the opportunity to work with and get to know over the years. Um, it scares me to death when I see the stories of what's happening uh, on TV and, and everything that's going on throughout the country when students don't know if they can feel fully safe going to school. Um, as a member of the school committee, I've fought tooth and nail for every available cent to upgrade our security in our public schools in Marshfield. One of the major reasons that I signed on to the campaign team for a new Marshfield High School is because I realized 
having been a student at Marshfield High School, uh, that it wasn't a safe facility. We now are proud to say that we have one of the very safest school facilities in the entire state. Um, I'm proud to have fought for important capital funding, hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years, to uh, upgrade our security at all of our elementary schools in Marshfield. And a state legislator <coughs> needs to take that fight to the state house. We need to fight for funding through the budget process or through other programs to come back to our communities and make sure that school districts aren't faced with buying books or making sure their students are safe. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And we need to be making sure that we're for common sense gun laws as well. The Extreme Risk Protective Order Bill that just passed is a common sense bill, and it shouldn't have taken that long, and it shouldn't have taken a tragedy to implement. Uh, so as a state legislator, uh, I will be fighting for that funding. I'll be fighting for those policies. Uh, too often we see uh, our students going to school uh, and they don't know whether or not they're safe, and that's unacceptable. Uh, I've lived fighting that issue for the last four years, uh, and win or lose this race, I'll continue fighting it. But once I'm at the state house, I'll fight it with every fiber of my being. So I think that uh, you know, gun regulation uh, is very, very important, as we're seeing on a national level. Um, as you said, kids do not feel safe in school. And what needs to be done is we need leadership to address this issue uh, head on. And we have a lot of common sense gun regulation here in the state of Massachusetts, uh, which by all measurable statistics is why we have the lowest murder rate in the country. We have the lowest gun violence rate in the country. We need to be working with our federal reps to push for that same uh, common sense gun regulation on a federal level and also be advocating um, for our own kids um, because there are not borders between states. We need to be lobbying other state legislators to adopt some of the same common sense gun regulation we here, have here in the state of Massachusetts. So that if um, you know, we aren't seeing that movement on the federal level, that we might see some of that movement uh, on the state level. Um, you know, I, I tell personally, uh, my cousin Ella went to uh, Sidgwick High School, um, and most recently we had an incident here um, where there was a lockdown situation. No kid should, should have to face that. No parent should have to face that. No parent should have to fear dropping their kid off at the bus and waiting for them whether or not they're gonna come home or not. So we need a strong leader to be advocating uh, for legislation on the federal level, to make sure uh, the legislation like the red flag bill uh, gets passed on the state level. Um, and then also we increase funding for mental health care. Uh, a lot of people do not have access um, in our schools to uh, adequate ratios between counselors and students. And um, we need to push to, to make sure that everyone that feels as though they might need help um, gets it before they act on, on anything. And, and that, you know, that speaks to social emotional learning in schools which we've really invested in in Marshfield and in Situate. Um, you know, we're by all accounts, Massachusetts is uh, a model for uh, gun control uh, in the entire country. Uh, we have mandatory 48-hour waiting periods, mandatory background checks. Those are good things. Um, but also at the local level, here in Marshfield and Situate, we're kind of becoming a model for social-emotional learning uh, in schools, making sure that our kids are well-equipped with the services they need for mental health. Proud to have uh, helped lead that fight in Marshfield Public Schools. And, um, you know, it's something that we should be looking at uh, for a statewide initiative. And it's, uh, in my opinion too, uh, Sean, it's, it's education-based as well. I, uh, I look forward to uh, working with, uh, you know, Seth Moulton, fellow service member, uh, and he talks a lot about this, is um, education um, on firearms. I don't think that anyone in this race, um, you know, wants to affect um, unduly anyone's Second Amendment rights. But I think that uh, you know we need to educate the general population. No individual needs an automatic M16, and and anyone that has used any of those uh, firearms, such as I have in my military training, uh, knows that no civilian uh, needs to have that. So uh, we need to be advocating uh, to make sure that nobody does. And the attorney general has been a great advocate for that at the state level with her uh, going after the copycat uh, rifles. It's, it's absolutely uh, true that nobody has any reason to own an assault weapon like that. And, and the Attorney General has been uh, a strong leader uh, on that issue. 
we as Democrats should be proud that she's been taking. She has that common action. sense. Right. Okay. Did you expect us to disagree on that one, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next one is for Kathy Hoffman. Hi, Patrick. And um, uh, what, if anything, do you intend to do for veterans? So, uh, as someone that uh, works closely with veterans, I'm uh, the Sergeant at Arms at the American Legion here in Situate. Uh, someone that uh, has been talking with uh, the Marshfield veterans as well, Bob Weaver with the Disabled Veterans Organization. Um, it's important that we take care of our veterans. Those that have gone overseas, uh, in some cases that have paid the ultimate sacrifice, uh, or are at least willing to give everything for all of us in this country, we need to be supporting them. Uh, when we get home and I think the biggest thing for me uh, it's been brought to my attention in this race and it's an issue that I uh, want to champion is the fact that veterans without a street address do not have access to VA health care less than 1% of the American population has served in the armed services in any capacity and we are further marginalizing our homeless veterans we need a bill uh, and a strong leader uh, not only at the state house um, but you know, someone that is, is going to not only work with veterans, but also with other representatives to make sure that we are not uh, further marginalizing our homeless veteran population and uh, working with those homeless veterans to try and find them affordable housing as well. Well, veterans fight our battles uh, across the sea so we can have freedom. Uh, they shouldn't have to come home and fight bureaucratic battles for housing, health care, and all the other benefits to which they should absolutely be entitled. Um, in the last four years uh, working at the State House, I've done a whole lot of work with constituent services, uh, and I've worked a lot with uh, veterans on a number of different issues, and it shouldn't be that hard uh, for them to get the health care that they're owed. Uh, you know, our, our veterans, uh, you know, come back here, and too often, uh, they uh, face uh, an, an inclinable wall to getting the, uh, the benefits that they're owed. Um, you know, I'd be a strong advocate for increased housing for veterans. Our Board of Selectmen in Marshfield just established a new housing facility for <coughs> veterans. That's a great thing, and it's, it's, it's housing right there in the center of town, and it's only it's, it's for veterans, and that is a great thing. But we can be investing even more in that, and we can do that at the state level. We have the ability to do those things. Uh, the state of Massachusetts has passed some important laws when it comes to providing for our veterans. Uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, we are one of the better states in the union for it, um, but there's a whole lot more we can do. And, uh, and I'll pledge to, to do that, uh, and to fight for their needs, and to fight for what they've earned uh, as they've fought for us. The other thing I, I forgot to add uh, before we move away from this topic is I'd also like to see uh, some increased coverage for life insurance. Uh, you know, some of the veterans uh, on active duty are only covered up to $400,000 uh, if they pass away uh, you know, in, in the line of duty. Um, in some cases when they have multiple kids and, um, you know, those kids want to go off to college, uh, I'd like to see some more coverage for, for their family so that they're not worried uh, if, if they're parent or, um, you know, both of their parents uh, are in a combat situation that, that they have a little more coverage and a little more security if, uh, if they happen to die in line of duty. Okay. Um, next one, Sean, if you were to become our next state rep, what priority would you give ethics and transparency reform at the state house? That's a good question. And, and you know, uh, the Massachusetts State House, for all intents and purposes, um, has done some good work on this. They've operated and updated their ethics laws. And as an employee uh, of the House for the last four years, I've had to keep up with those. They have us do mandatory ethics training every year. They also have us go through an online seminar that you do every year. That's important. And they don't just make the staff do it. They make every one of the representatives do it. Um, you know, it's it's absolutely something that, that continues to, to you know, require attention. Um, and that's purely and simply because it, it always comes with the territory when you're uh, an employer of hundreds of individuals. And uh, I can pledge now that, that as a state representative, I will always lead with integrity. Um, you know, it, it is, it, ethics um, you know, is something that should be at the forefront of every public servant's mind. 
know, it's a shame that we don't see that at the national level. Um, but I can tell you from experience that we're doing some good things here, but uh, you know, there's always more that we can do. Um, you know, we see with the Me Too movement that has been so powerful this year, how many women uh, have been impacted um, by, by sexual abuse, sexual assault, uh, all that sort of inappropriate behavior. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that our policies are consistent and up to date uh, so that we're providing for the safety of these people in the workplace. These are, are uh, fine young, young women and young men too who have been impacted, uh, who I've worked next to uh, for the last four years. Uh, they, they bring so much to the job and uh, we need to make sure uh, as legislators that we're doing everything we can to provide for their safety uh, and that absolutely boils down to how we behave uh, ethically and the laws that we enact. Um, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, the three words that are used in our training um, as officers in the United States military are honor, courage, and commitment. And I think it's important to, uh, whether in any public office, to be serving uh, with honor, to, make, uh, to, to have courage, to, to stand up for what you believe in, uh, and to, to fight for the constituents that you represent. Um, and, and commitment to doing the right thing. And I think uh, that some of the training that you have mentioned, uh, the State House, uh, it's, it's finally been enacted. Uh, they're 10 years behind the curve on things. Uh, the legislature should not be the last ones implementing uh, ethics training to its employees. And uh, to, as recently as the beginning of this summer, we have seen um, you know, a lack of uh, commitment to people both working in the State House and uh, people in the Commonwealth uh, by representatives um, that are not standing up for um, sexual harassment victims. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, as you know, with what happened to Representative DiZoglio uh, in, at the State House, you know, the use of taxpayer funds uh, and holding back her severance package when she was a legislative aide after she had, uh, you know, had some uh, encounters with an individual, that's not acceptable, and it's not acceptable to just stand by. You're just as much at fault, anyone that's working there that's standing by. It takes a leader to stand up and say that's wrong and, and work with everybody else for, and, and actively work until we see results for reform uh, to make sure that everyone is respected in the workplace. And that's why I'm proud for the last four years to have worked for a uh, man who is widely regarded as, as uh, just a great guy with a lot of integrity who does stand up for what is right uh, when the time comes. Uh, you referenced Representative Bizoglio. I was uh, watching in the chamber as she made her uh, her powerful speech, and it was just towards the start. So she was gaveled down by House leadership, and he's a part of House leadership. So, uh, Representative no. Bayer, he's a vice chairman. Which he is part of nothing, House leadership. Well, nothing to do with that. He, he needs to stand up to that the people that are not respecting her on the house floor. Well, he stood, he no, that's standing, but that what, what happened was is he stood up. Word that she said. She didn't, they didn't allow her to speak. How could, how could you say that he listened to any word that, he said, that she said? Because they value what she No, she was gaveled down, down by house leadership, and the speaker and was not even, did not even have the guts to come down to the house floor himself. Well, it's a contentious issue for sure. It's, it's something that is unacceptable, and everyone at the State House should be disgusted with what happened there and should be publicly speaking out against it. Well, the, the man that I worked for is a man of integrity, and I'm proud of that. I never said he wasn't a man of integrity. I understand. I said that it takes a strong leader to stand up to what was unethical and what happened. And what He's a part of House leadership, and House leadership gaveled someone down. And, with the, and that's a fact. And with the impact of sexual harassment on members of my family, uh, people that I count as close friends, uh, even some students that I have worked with in the past, it's an issue that I've been fighting for passionately uh, here at the local level on the Marshfield School Committee. Uh, we always are, are we, you know, I just led a full review of our policies and we implemented one of the strongest policies on sexual harassment in the entire state for a local school district. I'm really proud to have led that charge and I'll take that, uh, that uh, commitment uh, to the State House. I won't stand by. I will always make sure that I'm standing up for uh, these people. Like I said, I've worked next to them. I've valued their, their commitment and their, their contributions, and I'll continue to do so uh, as a state legislator. Okay. 
Um, I've got probably two more questions here, so let's see if we can get through those. It'll be about an hour then, I think. So, first one is on transportation costs, which have risen excessively to excessively high rates. What can be done? And Patrick first. So I think uh, you know transportation is super important. Make sure that everyone here, uh, whether they're working in the public or the private sector, uh, have affordable and accessible transportation for them to get to work every day. Um, I think that what's most important with transportation is making sure that the trains run on time, and that they get from the point that they need to go to, uh, and, and get people to work on time. Um, we have seen a call for a privatization of the T, something I'm strongly against. Uh, we have machinists and laborers, uh, friends uh, of mine that work in that industry. Uh, my father, uh, Brian Kearney, you know, worked for the MBTA, and it's so important um, that we use that skilled labor, uh, that unionized skilled labor, to make sure. Uh, that everyone that's working in the transportation sector is skilled because when we privatize and there's a lack of uh, a skilled workforce, that's when we start to see problems uh, with trains not running on time. Well, I'm, I'm proud that for the last four years I worked for one of the only legislators who had the guts to sign on uh, to letters, to budget amendments, and to legislation um, that urged Governor Baker not to privatize uh, the T and, and to, to reinstitute the Pacheco law uh, because we do uh, depend greatly on our public transportation throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As uh, somebody who worked in the city for the last four years, I depended on the red line every day. And I can tell you that I was sorely disappointed so many different times. Um, you know, we, we are in a good position where we've invested so much uh, into our public transportation, especially over the last few years, having worked for a representative from Quincy. I was involved with the project uh, to tear down and rebuild the Wollaston T station to make it more accessible. That's just one of a, nearly a billion dollars worth of investments that are being made on our public transportation. And we see here in Situate that we have access to the Greenbush line, and there's a new pilot program that's going to be done to, to, to explore reduced fares on the weekends. Down at the Frank Hines station, named after our uh, outstanding former representative. Um, so public transportation should absolutely be on the forefront of our minds. We also need to be looking at innovative new forms of public transportation. With Representative Harris' office for the last four years, I've worked extensively on a proposal to implement ferry service in the city of Quincy out of Squantum Point Park. Um, and, and that was a, a successful pilot program that we instituted and is now in its third year. Um, and we're gathering valuable data through that, not just for that district, but for the entire Commonwealth. Uh, so I, I understand transportation issues, uh, not just because I've lived them and had to take the red line every day and had to hope to God that it was going to be coming through that station and that there was a parking spot available or, uh, you know, that, that I could just depend on it and that there wasn't going to be a signal problem with Davis. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also because I've been working in the nitty-gritty of the policy and I've been involved with projects that update our transportation infrastructure uh, and, and, you know, obviously all of those jobs were, were uh, staffed by union members, which is incredibly important. We fought against the, the repeal of the Pacheco Act and I'll continue that fight and I'll bring that knowledge as your next state representative. Hey Patrick, anything else you want to add? Yeah, there's a, a, a few things that I, I uh, didn't touch on uh, to start. I think I had mentioned the importance of individuals getting uh, to work every day on time, but I think it's also important that uh, students from all over the state of Massachusetts have access to public higher education. Uh, you know, being someone that uh, went to public higher education myself, Mass Maritime graduate, uh, we know that there are so many colleges uh, in Boston and in the suburbs, and uh, making sure that uh, even our Greenbush line stops at JFK a little more often uh, to make sure that our students uh, have access to all the wonderful programs at UMass Boston. Um, I think that that's important as well. And I, I'd, I'd like to think of some innovative ways to reduce cost. Uh, the MBTA has a lot, uh, owns a lot of land. And I think, when I think about uh, Greenbush, when I think about the stations that we're situated, uh, there's a lot of room um, for some of those cover solar panels. We can sell that energy back to the grid uh, and, and reduce our, our costs. And, and put some of that money back into our infrastructure. 
And, and you know, just to, to add on to that a little more, is that um, you know, energy efficiency should absolutely be, be a, a major aspect of our future plans for our transportation infrastructure. Um, you know, we see now all of this investment, and that's mainly because our, our, uh, our red line, orange line, blue line, those are all um, you know, vastly outdated systems of transportation, and they all require uh, so much more of an investment. Uh, and once we make those investments in the proper way, and we devote the funding needed to make sure those are updated, those and our commuter rails, uh, that's when we can uh, start to, to, you know, start to go through the process of making sure that we're uh, being innovative, and it absolutely should be at the forefront of our minds. Uh, that's why um, we worked so hard to explore a ferry service, uh, which it, it, you know studies show is actually the most cost-effective means of transportation, public transportation in the entire state. It takes drivers off of our roads, uh, and it makes sure that we're still, um, you know, serving. Uh, the, the needs of the, the public to make sure they can get to work, get to school, uh, and get to it from A to B. Uh, so that's absolutely something we need to keep in mind. Okay, great. This is going to be the last question. Um, and um, Sean, you're going to start. Um, so uh, there's a few questions that are variations of this one. What life experiences make you a qualified candidate to lead the different demographic groups in our district and why don't you answer that question by telling us a little bit about some specific situations where you have used your leadership skills sure um, so I touched on it at the beginning where I grew up uh, in a working family I watched my parents work their hardest to provide for us uh, and you know, we fell on some tough times uh, and I watched them climb out of those tough times um, as a student in public school uh, Marshfield uh, Public Schools K through 12. Uh, I watched as our teachers didn't have adequate supplies uh, to teach the classroom. I watched as they used outdated textbooks that stopped uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, I watched as they used a facility that was not meeting their needs. Um, so uh, when I was able to, as soon as I was able to at a very young age, I decided to take action and get involved. So one of those examples that I give you would be that I knocked close to 3,000 doors to build a new Marshfield High School. I did a whole lot of media availability for that. As just a, a young, recent graduate, uh, I worked on that project uh, and, and was one of the first people to bring up that it needed to be done uh, when the school committee was discussing. Um, you know, at the, at the local level on the school committee, uh, I've provided leadership on a whole number of those areas where we, we face these issues and, and you know certainly some of them I can't discuss because there, there's privacy laws that come into place but we have 4,200 students in Marshfield Public Schools and when some of those students face serious issues uh, the buck stops here uh, and when our teacher we have uh, 800 faculty and staff uh, when they have issues the buck stops here um, and I utilize my experience as somebody who grew up uh, in a working family, as somebody who uh, you know, saw my parents struggle and, and, and pull themselves up, as somebody who went through public school, uh, I used those uh, specific uh, life experiences. Uh, and because of that, because of my experience in Marshfield Public School and because of my experience on the school committee and at the State House, but mostly because of the way I've been brought up by the people that I've been brought up by, uh, whether it be my parents, my grandparents who are here, uh, my, my family, uh, and close friends and mentors. Uh, that's why I know and I'm confident that I will be an effective representative at the State House because they've made me the person that I am, and I owe that all to them. Okay, Patrick? I know that I'm the best candidate to represent this district uh, as the next state representative. I uh, have a long uh, history and a varied history of doing different things. Uh, I have various life experiences, uh, both in the private sector and the public sector. Um, I went to public college. I'm a member of an organized labor union. I work here in situate to this day as a captain in one of our industry's most vital uh, you know, one of those vital parts of the economic engines. I'm the only candidate in the race that has military leadership training and military leadership experience. And I know that um, that varied experience from 
starting my own business, from working with organized labor, with uh, you know working with military officials, uh, and, and working uh, closely with my family and, and other activists in this community, uh, I know that I have the leadership ability to best represent uh, everyone here in Marshfield and Sitchin. Okay. Um, just, to, you know, just to give you a specific example, too, about where I've used that leadership on a specific issue is that uh, when I was first running for school committee as a young 23-year-old uh, um, student, uh, you know, somebody trying to get in on that ground level of the local government so I could learn more about how we do things. Um, you know, I went around and I talked to so many parents and the number one issue that they talked about was full day kindergarten and how in Marshfield we didn't have it. It cost $3,000 per student. Um, and the major reason why I wanted to address that, among others, it is because I looked back on my experience growing up and I thought, geez, if my parents worked so hard to provide me with these opportunities, and I know they would have wanted me to have the best possible education, and I know they would have wanted to pay that, but $3,000 for public education. So I set out on a mission, and for three years, I worked so hard on behalf of the people of Marshfield with uh, the rest of the school committee, and as the chair of the school committee leading this effort, and I'm so proud that we passed the uh, implementation of full-day kindergarten. Um, we announced uh, our initiative on the same day that unfortunately Situate announced they were rising, uh, they were raising their price by $500. Um, that's unacceptable for public education, and, and there needs to be a plan put in place uh, to, to uh, come up with a way to fund that over the next few years. I've done that, I know how to do that, and uh, I can be a resource for that. So that's just one example of utilizing that leadership to benefit uh, the people of uh, my district that I had served. And, and, and I congratulate you on that. Uh, you know, I think it's really uh, awesome that the kids in Marshfield have access to all-day kindergarten. I think that it's not only about one group of kids, it's about every kid in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And as you know very well, 89% uh, of, of towns have it. Um, there's another 11%, 83%, uh, maybe uh, that changed a little bit when Marshfield got it. Um, but uh, a lot of the municipalities in, Marsh, in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts still don't have that. And what it requires is leadership and making sure that we find other ways to fund that uh, education on a K through 12 level, but also that we keep public higher education affordable. I look forward to um, working with my uh, fellow Naval Reserve colleague, Mike Rush, and uh, acting upon some of the recommendations in Senate Bill 308, uh, Foundation Budget Review Commission, uh, revamping that Chapter 70 formula, and making sure that we have full day kindergarten, that we have adequately funded education, uh, K through 12, and, and that public higher education is affordable as well. So, absolutely. I look forward to uh, you know, picking your brain on that as the next state representative. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's, been, uh, that's been my fight for the last four years, uh, and that's going to be my fight uh, that I take to the State House on your behalf. That has been my reality. Uh, I am uh, incredibly well versed in those issues, and I can tell you inside and out the way that we are losing uh, out to that formula. Um, so, you know, I, I know better than uh, anybody else, and not just in the race, um, but uh, better than most in, in our communities, how. Uh, to, to solve those issues because in the entire South Shore region, uh, Marshfield is one of the only schools that has done this, uh, period. You know, 83% of districts have it statewide, but the holdout is the South Shore. And once again, uh, our uh, district took a lead, and that's because I took a lead in Marshfield. Uh, so I'm so confident that I'm the best person to go up to the State House and fight for public education, not just because of my public education experience, uh, but because of my experience fighting for our students, fighting for their families, fighting for our teachers, that's the passionate fight that I'm going to take to the State House. Okay. Patrick, is there anything else that you want to add to that? All right. Um, so now you each have two minutes um, for some summary comments. And um, as Patrick uh, started us off with his introductory remarks, Sean will finish. We'll start with the, um, the closing remarks. Well, I just want to uh, reiterate my thanks to you, Patrice, and to the Situate Democratic Town Committee for having us here tonight. I want to thank everybody who came out to join us tonight and hear what we have to say. Um, whether you're a supporter of mine, whether you're a supporter of Patrick's, whether you're undecided, I think it's so great to see everybody getting involved uh, in this uh, aspect of public life. 
um, you know, and, and I'm proud uh, to have been contributing to public life here uh, in the district for so long. Um, you know, I, I hope I've been able to effectively communicate to you all my experience, how the way that I know that things work, uh, and the passion that I have uh, for this district and for the people of this district uh, that I have called home my entire life. Um, my friend Jim Cantwell uh, has done outstanding work for the last 10 years. He's been an outstanding state representative, uh, and his impact on this district and on my life personally is why uh, a major reason why I'm running for this seat to continue the good work that he's done. Um, he's been that fighter that we needed, uh, but there is still so much more work to do. We have an opiate crisis that's taking a generation. We have crumbling coastal infrastructure and an environment crying for relief. We have public education that isn't funded nearly close to the level that it should be. I want to utilize my experience working four years in the in and outs of the Massachusetts legislature. I can hit the ground running on day one fighting for you because I know how it works and because there won't be a learning curve. I want to utilize my experience on the Marshfield School Committee taking a, a, a leadership role to benefit my community, a community that I love. I want to utilize my experience working with young people and seeing the next generation come up and all of the wonderful ideas that they have and the passion that they have for making their world a better place. I'm proud to be endorsed by former state rep Phil Johnston in this fight, among many other community leaders who have backed my campaign. Um, but most of all, uh, I'm proud to live in this district. Uh, I'm proud to have lived here my whole life, and it would be uh, the greatest honor of my professional life or my life in general, uh, to serve you as your next state representative on Beacon Hill. The times are too dire to not have somebody who has that experience, and I want to fight for you, and I hope to earn your vote on September 4th. Thank you. Patrick? Thank you so much uh, for coming tonight, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in tonight's forum. Uh, Robert Kennedy once said, the future is not completely beyond our control. It is the work of our own hands. And my family roots dating back to 1928 have instilled in me a love for this coastal community and I'm eager to roll up my sleeves and chart a better course for everyone in this room. The reality is young people do not have an advocate at the State House. We are facing issues like climate change, school shootings, and unaffordable costs to public higher education. And these issues require a new generation of leadership one that puts fiscally responsible attitudes and common sense legislation to work to ensure that we maintain sustainability. Our seawalls need to be sustainable. Our clean drinking water source needs to be sustainable. Our fishing industry needs to be sustainable. And we need to have senior centers that are sustainable. We keep electing people who don't know what it's like to walk in the shoes of the people that they're going to represent or have the passion to fight for the issues that are facing them on Beacon Hill. Please allow me the opportunity to earn your vote in September because I commit to you to bring the energy, the passion, and the leadership skills that this district needs right now at the State House. Just as the public-private partnership to create this wonderful building was so successful, my public sector and private sector experience is the winning combination that we need to get the job done. I'd love to hear more from all of you in this room. Uh, you can re reach us at our website, redelectpatrickkearney.com. My cell phone number is 781-690-7923. Uh, I live at 18 Lighthouse Road. My door will be all, always be open, and uh, I look forward to continuing knocking on yours. So uh, thank you for, again for coming tonight.